Welcome everyone to the Condo World Green Building Week webinar. So let's get started. Before we start, there are some housekeeping rules. So all attendees' mics are mute, but you can raise your questions via the Q&A box throughout the webinar, and we'll answer your questions toward the end. I will now hand this over to our moderator today, Oliver Grimaldi, to start our webinar. Thank you, Elaine, and uh, welcome everyone to World Green Building Week 2022, organised by the World Green Building Council and um, plenty of presentations happening around the world. Uh, it's always the third week of September every year. And this year's theme is uh, building for everyone. Uh, so we've taken it upon ourselves to look at retrofitting the built environment for a net zero carbon future. Um, and just to note as well, there'll be a small poll um, uh, shortly through this slide. So you're more than welcome to answer the uh, poll questions as we go through. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed uh, panelists who will be joining me today. Um, and uh, I'll start with Annie Scott, who is an asset and facilities management professional and is a current WA Facilities Management Association Committee Chair. She's passionate about the FM industry and also a strong advocate for women in diversity within the industry. Gregory Kovacs is a uh, de uh, design director at Benoit, uh, working across architecture and interior design throughout the Asia-Pac region. He has been awarded the Reba Goldfinger Scholarship and was recently selected for this perspective 40 under 40 award for architectural design. Matea Chahovin is sustainability manager at vicinity centers across Australia with over 10 years experience in the field of sustainability. Vicinity centers are very much at the forefront of sustainability in the retail and mixed use sector within Australia. And Matea's work is helping to drive that progress approach, progressive approach uh, across their portfolio towards net zero carbon. Dong Chen is a director uh, within Kundal and is a structural and bridge engineer chartered in the UK with over 20 years of project experience in Asia, Europe, MENA and the Americas. He's been actively developing integrated low carbon structural design strategies and tools and delivering sustainable structural solutions that do not sacrifice the design. And Michelle Ganley, uh, also at Kundal, Principal Controls Engineer for AsiaPAC, and has strong experience in providing technical advice and design to existing building owners within Australia to drive improvements and energy efficiency. And I'm Oliver Grimaldi, I'm Associate Director specialising in sustainability and leading Kundal's Perth team here in Western Australia. And I'll be presenting and moderating today's panel discussion. So uh, many of you, I'm sure, know about Kundal. Um, some of you might be new to Kundal. I'll just uh, reintroduce Kundal or introduce for the first time. So we're a global company. We were established in 1976. Uh, we now have 21 offices globally and over 1,000 people. Uh, we were the first one planet living company and the first carbon neutral consultancy globally. And we also have a, uh, a goal for net zero carbon design by 2030. And I'll explain that in a few slides. These are our locations across the world. As you can see, uh, today's uh, webinar is covering our Asia Pac region and there'll be uh, other webinars today and throughout the week in different regions uh, across the world. These are Kundal's general services that we provide, ranging from acoustics, building services, sustainability, civil and structural engineering, planning, uh, all the way through to transportation and vertical transport. And Kundal covers a wide uh, variety of sectors, ranging from aviation all the way through to workplace and everything in between. So as I said, we have a zero carbon design 2030 goal. Now, in short, that uh, that aspiration is to ensure that Kundal will only work on design projects that are zero carbon from 2030 onwards to be in line with the 1.5 degree um, agreement, Paris Agreement. But we recognise that a lot of our clients are at different stages of that journey and we're there to help them along that journey. So we've um, put together a uh, quite easy to understand seven, step of, uh, seven steps of achieving net zero carbon. Um, in the built environment. And that starts with your passive design and optimization, then thus reducing the operational energy demand and consumption within a building. 
after that, what we want to be looking at is eliminating fossil fuels completely, and that means no natural gas, trying to reduce or remove things like diesel, et cetera. Then we start to get into renewable energy, either on site or off site um, through green power purchase, et cetera. Then we want to focus on the embodied carbon. So I think the industry has done very well in terms of its operational carbon. Now the focus turns very swiftly onto the embodied side of buildings and limiting that upfront embodied carbon. And then we want to take a whole life carbon approach in conjunction with the whole life costing of the building. And lastly, it's about publicly disclosing and declaring the sustainability credentials of your building. So in this um, webinar we've got to today, we'll set the scene, remind ourselves on where we are with regards to climate change globally. Then we'll try to understand what is driving the change uh, with regards to sustainability in the built environment. Uh, a short few slides on the process, particularly around retrofitting existing buildings. And then we'll move on to our panel questions um, for our panelists. So there'll be uh, a short quiz now for you as attendees, and uh, we're going to be asking three questions. And the first question of which in this quiz, number one, what is the current temperature increase above pre-industrial levels? What is the current temperature increase above pre-industrial levels? 0 0.8 degrees, 1.0 degrees, or 1.2 degrees. I'll just give it a few, give it about a minute for people to answer. A lot of participation, it's looking good. Overwhelming, overwhelmingly in favor of 1.2. All right. We'll probably end it there, Elaine, and I'll reveal the answer now. If you answered, oops, if you answered 1.2 degrees, you are correct. So the current global temperature increase is 1.2 degrees, and we're seeing that, and that's very evident in uh, across the world. Pakistan has just had its worst flooding ever in history, recorded history. Uh, the UK and Europe have had massive heat waves and bushfires. The UK reached 40 degrees, which had never happened in my lifetime living there, um, and other various climate um, events all around the world, including severe flooding in, in the eastern states of Australia. Okay, so we move on to question two. I'm hoping this one will be a nice, easy one for everybody. Question two, how much of global emissions come from the built environment? So if you think of global emissions, it being a pie chart of 100%, what percentage of that comes from our built environment? 20%, or 40%, or 60%? It's a bit neck and neck between 40 and 60 at the moment. If you answering 20%. Oh, cool. Okay, we'll call it there. We'll end that poll, Elaine. That was very quick responses. So 40% won, and those who uh, had put in 40% were correct. So 40% of the great global greenhouse gas emissions originate from our buildings globally. And uh, uh, question three, what percentage of buildings that will be standing in 2050 are already built today? So how many of those buildings in 2050 are the ones you see uh, around us at the moment? And that's 30%, 55% or 80%. This is a bit of a tricky one. How do you predict the future to 2050? Well, this is really neck and neck. 30%, 55%, 80%. no call. This is a photograph finish. Fifty-five percent is in the lead. Okay, that's that's a really good and quick response, Elaine. We'll call it there. And uh, the answer to that question was actually eighty percent. Eighty percent of our built environment today 
will be existing in standing in 2050. Now that's a lot. That's a big problem that we currently have with regards to our built environment and net zero carbon globally. And that's where the focus of today's discussion is. And then uh, a last question, there won't be a poll for this one. Um, the question is, how urgent is this problem? I think we all know the answer to that. And the answer is very urgent. So even if we were to stick with uh, the agreed 1.5 uh, degree increase uh, as per the Paris Agreement, that would still be uh, a huge problem for us. But projections globally uh, are looking closer to that three degree mark, which is predicted to be catastrophic. Now the IPCC uh, now predicts 1.5 degrees to be hit by 2030. So in less than eight years time, now, what does 1.5 degree look like globally? Or is there an increased probability of an ice-free Arctic summer in any one year? 41% increase of area burnt by wildfires in an average Mediterranean summer. Now, we've already seen the bushfires that uh, have you know, run ragged across uh, places like Spain and Italy and Portugal just this summer gone. So it's, uh, it can be catastrophic. Now we do in the built environment have the net zero carbon buildings framework, which looks at um, new buildings to be net zero carbon in operation as a guide on how to do that. But there, there's also a target that by 2050 that all existing buildings will be net zero in operation as well. But uh, noting that new buildings will be whilst net zero in operation also net zero in terms of their whole life carbon. So also their embodied carbon up front in their existing embodied carbon from 2050 onwards. So what is driving that change as well as uh, what we see around us globally? Well, thankfully, uh, many governments and countries are actually taking action and making pledges towards net zero carbon. And those are some examples you can see on the screen. Some of them have declared uh, an early target, which is, uh, I consider quite ambitious. Um, and there are many, many more, uh, but that's just, how many flags we can fit on this screen but many are trying to declare to be net zero carbon by 2050 but local authorities and councils are actually driving that change and often going further than their own governments and setting uh, higher targets with regards to zero energy and renewable energy etc but also it's the people we see many protests globally calling for urgent action and that's not just the younger generation that's all generations uh, across the world and what are the other drivers, further drivers for this change? Now, investors uh, in the built environment are required to meet uh, CSR requirements and undertake risk analysis. And those are some of the frameworks that we're seeing and using and undertaking for their assets at the moment. Developers are being squeezed by their investors, uh, but also their tenants. And many of them have actually signed up to the World Green Building Council's net zero carbon commitments in conjunction with all the other green building councils around the world. But it's actually a huge occupier and tenant demand. Tenants are now saying they don't want to move into buildings that aren't net zero or have a high sustainability credential because they have their own policies to meet and their own science-based targets. And many of them are actually becoming carbon neutral organizations. There's also something called CREM, which is a carbon risk real estate monitor which has been used extensively in Europe. Now what this looks at is the Paris trajectory of 1.5 degrees and tries to ensure that our built environment was to meet that. Now if you took an existing asset and its current performance uh, in this example and we did no intervention at some point we would see what's called a stranding event. So if we did no retrofit, there's a good chance that that building could be a stranded asset and potentially become unpurchasable. And what we want to do is see those retrofit interventions nice and early so that that building can go on being a, a purchasable asset and in line with that Paris trajectory. And the global real estate uh, in terms of its assets globally is, is a huge, huge problem. The world's real estate valued at $326.5 trillion as of 2020, and that's more than global equities and debt securities combined. And it needs to be net zero carbon and currently isn't. Now, if we look at asset values as of today, if you took a, an average property value today, 
and we did no intervention or took no action, there's a good chance that that, we, that particular building will have higher operating costs. Um, there'll be a rising cost of carbon, an increased compliance cost to actually keep it running, higher cost of capital. And in the end, uh, there's something termed a brown discount, which is pretty much the opposite of a green premium. So there'll be a discount uh, uh, applied to that building. It would lose its asset value. Now, there's uh, thankfully something that we can do and we can make these uh, sustainable changes. And that is uh, including green premium and faster sales, low operating costs, maximizing fiscal incentives, lower cost of debt through sustainable financing and new products and revenue streams through sustainability. And there's a, there's a good chance that we can increase the potential value of those assets. Now, just very briefly, I mean, the, the, this is a very detailed um, uh, line of study in terms of how do we change our existing um, built environment. But if we take this example, we know if we know what the path to net zero is, regardless of whether it's 2030 or 2050, and we know what the energy uh, intensity, for example, needs to be, and we need to get down to that level, we can actually start to make those changes. Um, there are many changes you can make to a building. These are just some examples, including a wholesale facade replacement, upgrade of all the lighting. The HVAC is probably the biggest one. Removing gas boilers, that's a huge one. Um, that's happening at the moment, changing those out uh, to heat pumps, et cetera, all the way down to a full lift replacement. And what we can do with that, what that does allow is existing asset owners to plan for those, obviously, a lot of those interventions and changes need capital, they need cost, and we can actually map those out in an asset management plan. Now, without further ado, I want to bring in our panelists. Uh, we have a number of questions. We're actually gonna keep these questions on the screen for our audience. Um, and we'll start with the first question. And the first question to our panelists is, uh, how do you see the current market appetite for retrofits versus new developments and I might throw that over to Gregory if I may to begin with. Welcome Gregory. Thank you Oliver, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so um, we, see, we, see, we, we see retrofits as an ever-growing uh, segment in the market and if, especially if you think about the, the statistics that you were showing that 80% of the existing uh, buildings will be there in uh, 2050, it's very understandable why this is probably the most important market segment that, uh, that we can look at. So, but not just because of that, we, we are actually very passionate about, uh, about this, this field. Um, we very strongly believe that that the most sustainable way of building, and it might sound strange from an architect, is actually not to build. So <laughs> reuse, reusing our existing underperforming uh, building assets. And I think it has a couple of uh, uh, very key benefits to sustainability. Obviously, you have the environmental part where you are having something that really reduces the embedded carbon. And, and you mentioned that uh, the, the, the focus is shifting towards that, which I think is very appropriate. But I think there's also another side of it is that when you when you think about these underperforming assets, it's not simply um, there's a, there's a social impact to it. So they are part of a neighborhood, and when you have a building there that is actually not doing much, it's actually a problem for the whole neighborhood. So by revitalizing these these assets, you're actually doing something that is not just for uh, for environmental sustainability, but also doing a lot for the for the social sustainability part. Uh, and then from a very kind of personal perspective as architects, I mean, for us, uh, these are actually the most exciting and uh, design challenges. The reason being Ooh. is that, first of all, there's so many constraints that you have to work with. Uh, the second is that many of these underperforming assets, they are fundamentally not suitable for, for contemporary requirements, which means that even if you don't want to or the client doesn't want to, you have to innovate. You have to come up with something new because the, the typical model simply doesn't work on this. And, and this, this, this drive to innovation is actually really, really exciting for us. Mm. Excellent. Do we have any other um, responses to this question from our other panelists? Yes. Um, hi, I'm happy to, to um, hi, add Mateo. something to that. Um, <clears throat> following on from, from Gregory, that is sort of um, vicinity's 
um, I guess, future direction where with a large number of our assets, we are exploring mixed use to um, repurpose, um, not so much repurpose our existing shopping centres, but add to them in that mixed use space. So co-locate mm. um, uh, both offices and residential to really create multi-purpose precincts. Um, so it is creating new, but it's also reusing um, reusing the existing. And then while we're doing that, taking the opportunity to actually retrofit our existing shopping centres um, um, and improve, you know, their energy efficiency or their um, uh, remove fuel use. So it's it's something we're um, uh, moving to in the future. So that's that's about changing how buildings are used, how they're operated, rather than just uh, keep keeping their existing operation model. Uh, as you say, bringing in mixed use, bringing in residential, bringing in other other typologies to make them more of a living precinct than just a statutory building. That's yeah. correct. While reusing what is already there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do we have any other um, responses on this question from our other panelists? Yep, I'll jump in. Any? Hi, um, hello. On our side, obviously at, at Centuria, we predominantly move around the built-in environment. So um, to to add to um, to the other panelists, we our biggest challenge is is around the retrofits on all of our assets. And obviously, we predominantly we have commercial assets, but we also have industrial and health and some of the retail assets as well. So for us, it's all about telefitting our approach to each and every one of them and having a look and see what can we do where, how quickly mm -hmm. and how feasible it is um, for us to get more efficiency out of our assets. It's it's a real challenge because every asset is, is very different. And like Gregory mm -hmm. was saying, um, it, it's, it is difficult to incorporate some, you know, uh, new technology into older buildings. So it, it is the challenge that we have at the moment. I mean, particularly around workplace, it, 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 there's a big tenant demand for that type of workplace, the offering that uh, an office place gives more than the one next door. So um, I'm sure you're seeing as well, we see a lot of workplaces having to go through that retrofit. And for example, people aren't uh, taking as many cars to the workplace. So retrofitting uh, basement car parks for example to use as I don't know health and well-being and yoga spaces you know completely upgrading the end of trip facilities allowing people to to bring in more bikes etc yeah I think look we we're not only competing with next door uh, now after the pandemic we we're competing with people's mm. home as well because yeah. you know working from home is um, is what we're also competing with so we we have to make the workplace attractive and it has to be different and I think ultimately what we will offer is a community you know it mm -hmm. which is which is what you want to go to work to you want a workplace that that is you know sustainable but also a community that you want to get up and go to every day yeah that's a good point actually you've got to make, you've got to make the office more attractive or attractive than yeah. home otherwise we don't need the workplace um you know, we, we, we often talked about that, you know, 15, 20 years ago about hot desking and remote working and all of those. It's now finally here. Um, but I, I still think there's a fundamental uh, need for humans to be together. I don't think the workplace is going away anywhere. But yeah, as you say, it's, it's about making it more attractive than the home. Yeah. Yeah, it's chipping just to add one, one more point. I think for the mm. uh, major challenge, apparently, uh, when we say retrofit or new build, uh, depend on the region, uh, countries, and probably more uh, developed country. I'm not looking at the retrofit, or from speaking the experience from where I'm based in Hong Kong. Uh, so less and less chance you can have a new building because it's just the cost of and also the uh, carbon impact. And I uh, think, but that brings a new challenge for 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 for, for structure engineer or as part of the design team is to create a a flexible space from at the first place. One of the interesting factor is most building or project design uh, design life is like 50 to 75 years. Infrastructure could, could be like 100 to 120 years, depending on the importance of the, of the project itself. 
So mm -hmm. if, if, can you imagine you design something, you know, 50 years ago can still uh, suitable for the tenants during that 50 years, you know, it's, 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 it's mm -hmm. a, a, a enormous uh, uh, challenge for the designer in the first place. And so the how to plan this and but the avoid over design uh, uh, with the moment in the first place is is a, is a interesting topic uh, for everybody in the in the, from the client briefing to the, the design a design of solution proposals and uh, and the uh, maximum how to maximum the uh, or extend the life of the building to uh, reduce carbon impact and this is uh, something we we need to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Buildings should be built to last longer. Uh, I think it was this this year, the first time we saw global populations actually start to taper off. It's still growing, but growing at a, at a slower rate. Um, so these buildings are potentially going to be around for a lot longer than they were originally proposed for. Yeah. All right, um, I'll move on to question two. Uh, now, question two is, what impact will tenant demand for better standards and green certifications have on existing buildings? I'll throw that out to our panelists. I'm, I'm happy to, to start in, in this yeah. space. Um, so I guess from a retail perspective, it is a bit different than commercial offices, especially in Australia, um, commercial offices, um, have for a long time had that competition in terms of, um, uh, you know, all sorts of green certification, whether it's the um, neighbour certification or um, or Green Star, um, and tenants certainly um, have over many many years started demanding more and more. So it's pushing that standard up in um, in commercial offices. Retail is probably lagging a bit behind. That is not to say that um, we are not. Um, uh, getting ourselves certified and benchmarked. Um, certainly vicinity um, does um, neighbours um, certification and green stuff performance. Uh, but overall, um, from a tenant perspective, it is lagging a bit behind in, in that demand. Um, <clears throat> so it'll be interesting um, to, to see, I think um, there's a tsunami coming um, in the next mm. few years. And we're already seeing that with um, some national brands. The one that always comes to mind is, is Country Road. Um, mm -hmm. They have their own um, Green Star interiors certification for their, for their shops. So um, us as a, um, a shopping centre owner, where they would be and they are located, it's helpful for their certification if we have these certifications. Um, and why I say there is a tsunami coming, we are um, getting more and more queries um, uh, from our um, retailers in particular at this stage um, and national, um, I guess, brands with national foot, uh, with a national footprint um, around sustainability and um, renewable energy and, and how we can um, help them in their journey, um, their sustainability journey, uh, which also fundamentally helps us as well. So um, I think it's a place um, and a space to watch from a retail perspective compared to um, um, commercial, which is um, you know pushing the boundaries already. Yeah, I I, I, yeah. I certainly uh, concur with that and agree with that in the retail space. You've already mentioned Country Road, MJ Bale, um, recently a, 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 a soup and um, former wear provider clothes. They became carbon neutral, and, and we spoke the other day, Matteo, about even down to the small kiosks such as Boost Juice and having their demands yes. for for uh, you know organic and food. Waste. So you know you've got to retrofit or re redo your 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 waste storage, for example, to to cope with those commands and demands. From... That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to to add to what Matea just said, and um, some of our building are, are mixed used and obviously predominantly commercial, and we find that the commercial tenants are bringing the the retail tenant along, or they're dragging them along because obviously we've got a very wide range of very well-educated tenants, which are pushing us really, really hard. And, you know, for me, I work in operation, it's, it's brilliant. You know, you don't have to have the argument with anyone about spending any money. It's coming from the tenant. How great um, that they're driving higher standards. You know, it makes leasing harder uh, or negotiation harder, but it makes my job and my team's job easier to deliver on what we already 
want to deliver on. And ultimately, it's a benefit to, to the asset overall and, and to the you know, fund investor because it, it benefits the, the asset and sometimes um, the tenant demand assist you in driving that asset over the line and, and getting greener certification quicker. And this is happening right now. You've got lease negotiation um, for, you know, for, for people departing or sorry, company departing buildings in in 2025. 20, um, and we, we need to accommodate right now for a 2030 lease. So um, I think that the demands from the tenants are very encouraging and um, it would just help us really in, in our education piece to the broader um, tenant range that we have. I find that, um, to add to what Matteo was saying, that our small retailers are the one we have to work the hardest on the, the education mm. piece. It, it's, a lot, uh, it's a lot more demand financially for them as well. So it's, it's a lot harder. Um, but yes, um, ultimately, I think it's a very overall positive impact. We should embrace it and have all of those tenants everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the most, the, yeah, absolutely. The most difficult in terms of retail, especially food and beverage at the moment, is getting the industry through the difficult phase of not having gas cookers. <laughs> um, you know, oh, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very tricky one, both in the workplace when you've got a cafe downstairs, but also in the retail. Uh, all food and beverage is still demanding their, their, their gas cooktops. Um, but we, we understand at the moment, you know, through some commercial kitchen specialists that, um, young chefs these days are being trained in induction cooktops, not just for the sustainability aspect, but actually uh, health and well-being and safety perspective as well. So uh, I guess that's helping our argument a little bit too. <laughs> mm. And you have to, yeah. you you have to, you know, it's an education in the negotiation piece. You would have never thought we would be talking about induction cooker versus gas cooker. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's how quickly the market is moving. And, and just to close off on that, what I find positive about, you know, the tenant demand in this case is that we're working together, you know, uh, and then obviously we're forming stronger bonds with our tenant by saying, okay, let us have a look, see what's feasible, um, you know, create green certification and a retrofit. It, it's never easy and it takes a lot of um, work in the background to assess um, a building, um, you know, capabilities. So I think that working with them, it also makes them understand the back of a house and how everything works. So we all get a very good education and peace and a very strong bond in between us and the tenant from it. Mm. And you're and competing in that. The... Sorry, you don't <laughs> mm -hmm. I was going to say, I think that is actually a, a really key point in this, whether it's the tenants driving it or whether it's, um, you know, us driving it as the, the asset owner, it is that. Um, education, awareness raising and collaboration that is critical for us to achieve um, this mutual goal, goal for um, our, our society. So it's, it's um, I think it's a really heartening um, that you have that push from tenants in, in commercial and then um, us as, as retail owners encouraging and pushing and educating our uh, retail tenants um, to come on the journey with us as well. So it's, it's a plus plus win win for everyone. Yeah, but I think, I think I it's actually even even a larger group of kind of stakeholders because um, if you think about um, let's say condol or, or architects like us, I think we are all, we are all all part of this trying to push each other uh, to to get to a more sustainable future. So the, I think the tenants, the landlords, the government, uh, and the consultants, they are all all need to take their part on on trying to push the other a little bit further than what their comfort zone is. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. You know, we, we as I covered very briefly in, in the slides, it's it's from top down to bottom and back again, it seems to mm. be uh, all moving in the same same direction. And there's a, there's a wave coming as Matea said, <laughs> which is good. Um, all right, I'll, I'll move on to question three. Uh, just briefly as well for our audience, you're, you're more than happy to, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, put in your, your questions for the panelists. Um, so feel free to enter any questions into the Q&A box um, and they'll be happy to answer some of those questions at the end for you. 
So question for you for our panelists, how is the future of the market looking and how can we prevent the stranded assets scenario? No, it's, it's mostly in the real estate and, and commercial real estate um, sector, but I'm sure that will fall through all sectors. Okay. I don't, Annie? Well, uh, yes, I'll have to answer that one then. Look, <laughs> how is the future looking? I think it's looking good, right? I think um, <laughs> we, we got, you know, as, a, as a summary, I think, you know, uh, even, you know, Condor putting, putting something together shows the appetite for it. So I think, how does it look and how can we prevent it? We prevent it. For me, 101 is education. I think you've got a lot of experts here on the panel, but we, we got to spread the word to every single stakeholder because it is a collaborative effort like um, Matea was saying. So we need education and we need engagement. So, you know, education is one piece, then engagement is another one. It, it's awareness of how a current asset works, how, was, how it was built in the first place. And, you know, there's obviously um, capabilities that, you know, we can't push beyond on an existing commercial asset, but it's how can we use these, um, you know, great brains like Gregory and, and go and, and get, you know, some great solutions to, to something that was built. I mean, and having all the stakeholders, you know, being there and be participating to that outcome, it, it obviously already helps you build a community. So for me, it's about education and changing perception. You know, we, we do a lot of, or we used to do a lot of end of life. Um, we need to start having or continue to have those discussion of, of changing the concept of end of life, you know, and when something comes to end of life, I have a look at a decision making process where we go, hold on a second, how can how can we retrofit something into this equipment to to give it a second life? You know, we I think um, again, you know, surrounding yourselves with with experts that can help you with that decision. And I think also it's about incorporating, incorporating ESG right now, you know, into your day-to-day -day maintenance. It doesn't have to be grand sweeping statements, you know, you, you know, LED is important. Just have a look around. I, you know, is your building already um, has everything that you could be doing um, bef before anything else? Um, I think, you know, you have to have a look at becoming your own trendsetter you know you you don't have to wait for anyone else around you to to just come and, or go and do something the little steps are actually what matters and i think you know from from a building manager to a property manager to an investor to a tenant everyone can just participate to assist in having your asset or the asset that you operate within not get stranded so i think predominantly I'll fall back on education. So how, how do you think that's changed? You know, the typical way of doing asset management plans and planning for the next five years, you know, when, when the boiler comes to life, the end of life, we'll throw in a like for like. How, how is what, you know, the, the assessments like QUEM and other pieces of education, how has that changed that management of buildings? Well, there, I think there's a couple of steps to answering that i think i think you know if, if you don't know that this is happening you you have to educate and if you know then educate others because um otherwise people won't know that you know how to achieve these things there's a lot of literature and there's a lot of certification if you're new at this it's very confusing so i think mm -hmm. you know um surrounding yourself with with experts that i mean there's a lot of literature on the internet so you can start with that uh, and then go there. And then it's about having a look at, um, you know, how end of life can be, um, I don't know, a renewal of life <laughs> rather than end of life start by changing your vocabulary. That's an easy one, right? And then um, just have a look at, um, you know, you know gas, gas boilers to, to heat pump is great. It's a very easy, most of the time, most of the time, any it's an easy change but it's just um having a look at it you know you don't know what you don't know so i think again end of life to change the end of life concept you need to know that it needs to be changed so yeah. and i think that the majority of people 
unfortunately don't. So um, mm. we all have a duty of care to just share our knowledge and, and make sure that um, everyone around us uh, know and, and spreads the world on, on how we look at um, any asset on a property that's coming to an end of life. How do we change that perception? Yeah. Um, Matteo, do you think the, the concept of stranded asset will fall through into retail and beyond? Um, I think um, definitely. <clears throat> In particular, uh, I agree with everything Annie said, but I would add additionally, it's not just about um, retrofitting for net zero, but also retrofitting for climate resilience, because yes, we're trying to achieve net zero so we limit the impact of climate change but there's already locked in changes and changes <clears throat> more change, changes will come so it's doing both is it's as Annie said you know creating new life of the assets within your assets or your HVAC whatever it is but how do we extend that life um, or even if it's a replacement at end of life make sure that it is suitable for um you know, future environmental conditions and taking on board what Dong sa said before around not over-designing, mm -hmm. um, whether it's um, through a refurbishment or you're building new, it does either or, it doesn't matter. It's how do you not over-design, but design the right way so that it's both achieving net zero, but also being climate um, climate resilient because we're going to have these, um, you know, acute mm. climate events, floods, bushfires, um, more and more. And on the education piece, um, and this is a conversation we're um, starting to have um, uh, at vicinity, is actually bringing our finance finance folk on um, on this journey as well, um, mm. so that um, you know these considerations are building to business cases that need to be created to get financing internally. Um, and it's, at least in our company, they're quite passionate. Um, they may not quite understand. We're all, we're all together on this journey <laughs> trying to, to fit in sustainability into finance. Um, but yeah, the team it's not, is, it's not is, an easy, um, it's not a seamless it's, mix. <laughs> it's, it's not, um, cause there's a lot of, um, obviously a lot of trade-offs, but, um, I think, close collaboration and education and um, um, you know engagement with with the finance teams um, mm -hmm. I think is critical to to achieve that so that you don't get those internal barriers of oh you know it's it's too expensive or the payback's not there or, or, or whatever excuses um, you know um, I usually come up with not to proceed with an ESG solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely yeah. and to add to this and since Gregory is on the line I, I would throw him a question I mean do we also have enough technical expertise on the market at the moment to, to be doing these retrofits you know I think that's one of the big questions that that comes from us you know it's not the education and all piece just around our investors asset manager but it's also around our vendors you know the a replacement of a you know, HVAC, AHU, sometimes it's a lot easier than a retrofit. Um, you know, do we have the technical expertise out there within our vendors to assist us in, in, in making those, those decisions together? You know, we, we also need assistance on that side. Mm. So I think that expertise comes at, at many diff, from many different places. I don't, I think it's, it's many of these projects, especially repositionings are, are all about collaboration because these are very complex, much more complex projects than, than, than a new build. And, and, uh, and the only way you can manage that complexity is by collaborating with others. So for example, in our case, uh, we have, uh, we have very consciously been building up uh, a team and and a portfolio of of repositioning projects. We started doing that maybe like five six years ago. Back then, it was not not a very fashionable thing. Those were the projects that no one actually really wanted to take on, and we were actually very keen to get into that into that um, into that field. But it's not just about us. It's really working with with uh, sustainability experts like Condo and. And, and also suppliers to 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 figure out what are the what are the bespoke solutions for these problems because the uniqueness of this is that almost every problem in these um, retrofit projects are are very very unique and bespoke. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll move on to thank you guys. That was that was uh, really good uh, feedback on those questions. Um, 
Question four, what role can or is government playing to improve existing building performance? What role is or can government play uh, to improve an existing building performance? I'll throw that out to our panelists. Yeah, we have people from uh, living in Australia, in uh, Hong Kong, uh, people who have backgrounds in, in various different countries in Europe. What do you think uh, the role is for government at the moment? Yeah, I'll watch a beam uh, for this one. Um, the actually it's an interesting thing to say because the most time, most time designer when look at it, look at design from first place, always think about the regulation and the uh, and the practice code. Um, but it's funny to say uh, most of the code design codes are established based on experience from the past. Uh, imagine we use the the knowledge from the past to handle the future problem. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of always trying to catch up. Um, so I think I think these, uh, there's a, a trend in in some of the um, uh, government or, or organization trying to look into the issue to, for example, to set up the or review the code to in order to handle the uh, future, for example, climate change, uh, implement some of the uh, latest scientific researches and developments to make sure the uh, the parameters or factors uh, formulas adopting the code are. Uh, are most update and also cut for the uh, future challenges. I think there was a good example is uh, we've been using lots of like a euro code for example, uh, established by Europe, European Commission. They 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 had a study mandate to uh, to 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 provide the revision uh, and create a second generation euro code. So the idea of the euro code is trying to say okay they think about performance based design, uh, design for sustainability, uh, different type of material. A more mm -hmm. more optimized design factors, and uh, for example, uh, wind, uh, thermal, earthquake, because this kind of nature uh, issues uh, forces will change uh, when the climate changes. It's a natural natural link together. So um, so so this is a, this is a very uh, interesting and, and a, a positive uh, trend in the in the from the government side as a as a, a, a initiative. Uh, and we'll we'll have big impact to the design industry or construction industry as well. Yeah. Mm. yeah, we've seen a shift in in sentiment generally in Australia with the change of government recently. Um, didn't take very long for them to change their targets back to where they, at least uh, the, the the rest of the Western world had agreed. Um, so it often depends who you get and and which way it's swinging at that stage. You know, economic pressures, uh, you know, have a massive influence on on governments and the way people vote, and then ultimately, where which way the the wind blows with regards to sustainability. Uh, we certainly see that um, in, in Europe. We certainly see that here in Australia, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other inputs um, for question four? Otherwise, I can move on to question five. And we've got some questions from our audience racking up. So um, I'll just move on to question five. What best practice strategies are being implemented to optimize the lifespan of existing buildings? Hey, Michelle? Yeah, so I can probably jump in from a technology point of view. I think. Um, Building controls and smart building platforms are definitely being used to optimize the lifespan of existing buildings. So you've got energy monitoring systems, which are obviously being used to track how a building is performing and also to identify any buildings that maybe aren't meeting their targets before it starts to become an issue. And then you've got analytic systems, which are using data to predict faults with systems before they occur so that you're not having to look at replacing assets, you're more looking at repairing things. Um, I think, yeah, so I think data-driven maintenance is probably the biggest thing in the controls industry at the moment that is focusing on optimizing the lifespan of existing buildings. Yeah, they say that data is worth more than gold these days. So, it's it's the future. I guess it's the future of buildings to 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 actually analyze, collect lots of data on how build, people are using the actual building, and then adapt itself um, to 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 that that building usage. Uh, I guess. So, introducing smart technologies. Are you finding on your projects that um, retrofitting 
uh, up-to-date technologies on older buildings is possible or is it just incompatible generally? Definitely possible. So we're finding that obviously a lot of people have this idea that if you've got some, you know, old 20-year-old legacy system that it's not going to fit in with any kind of new analytics or smart buildings platforms. But we're finding there's almost always a way to get things sort of communicating and talking to each other. So it's definitely something um, that we're seeing a lot of in a lot of Kundal's projects at the moment is that retrofitting the older kind of building management, lighting control, lift control systems into the newer smart building platforms to get the existing assets just performing a lot better than they currently are. Mm. Yeah, so the, the age-old uh, response of, well, it's old, it, we're not going to be able to update it anyway, we'll just keep it as is, it's, 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 it's no longer valid anymore. You know, it, it, mm. it, It's being proved to be possible to upgrade your existing building in a smarter way. Yeah, yeah definitely. to add to... To add to what Michelle is saying, also technology is moving so rapidly that, um, you know, what was not necessarily available five years ago, very expensive five years ago, you know, analytical was not sexy five years ago. It was expensive. <laughs> it was difficult. <laughs> it was it, it was it was hard, you know, not, not people you needed big budgets so on premium buildings. Yeah. You know, uh, it's an easy one to to get over the line, but I think on on you know assets where uh, budgets are a bit more restricted, it was very difficult. And I think also, you talk about optimization. I agree with that. I think um, we got to understand that there's a little bit of diff there's a bit of a difference in between monitoring and optimizing. Like you can't optimize without monitoring. And I think that that's a very clear distinction that you need to just monitor what you've got understand how your AHUs are performing, understand how your HVAC is performing. And you'll be surprised at the cost savings that are so little, a fine tuning of your building. Sometimes it just is so little um, mm. and, and you can get, you know, it, this is a difference sometimes in between a 5.8 neighbors rating and a six neighbors rating is the monitoring of your equipment. And trust mm. me, that point two is hard to get. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, for me, for me, yeah, it's data, data, data. I've written it three times, but it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's data that you can use. You know, I, I think that we've got a lot of providers out there now that are a lot more, uh, savvy at giving us a solution that is more tailor fit you know there are some algorithm i do not do not want to see across a bms you know I, it doesn't serve a purpose for maintenance and you know get rid of it just um, have your tailor fitted analytic on your building that your building manager that your hvac vendor can work with and i mm. think that also what we need to start thinking of is that data driven maintenance naturally reduces our carbon footprint because we don't have wasteful attendance. We don't have, you know, uh, three people rocking up for a controls issue when it's not a mechanical issue. You've got one person rocking up, you know, the fault finding for essential services is really the way to go because we just don't touch something that doesn't need to be touched. You know, we don't I don't know, grease up something that doesn't need to be greased up. We actually target our maintenance to what needs to be done. And that is mm. very important for us. Yeah. On the topic of data as well, also the data of how people are using buildings is really important in making spaces as flexible as possible. So knowing when and where people are using certain spaces with occupancy data and things like that, we're finding portfolio managers are really, really valuable valuing that information at the moment absolutely yeah, i mean what's not to love about it you know lift data i must be crazy but i love it <laughs> i just i love how you can regroup people to a destination how you can demonstrate that on a building you know i think that rounds back up to educating people you know when when you're saying hey look how hard we're working at not using our lifts when we don't need to um look at hard you know we, we're not coming to site when we don't need to we're working hard behind the scene you know so i think it's good mm. that data helps us demonstrate that which is very useful for us yeah retrofitting an old workplace as well to to which which, which was set to have stationary desks you know 
uh, the 10 meters squared as the desk as your lighting grid etc you have to completely change that idea to these flexible working spaces hot desking these uh, bump zones or whatever they call them um, seated you know sort of in in the new ABN headquarters here in WA's um, most of their meetings are done around a coffee table on a sofa um, you know it's, it's, it's completely wow. changing the way workplace is done I think flexibility mm -hmm. is, is is really crucial in this because we we all work very hard to have some kind of uh, tangible predictions for the future, but uh, but we have to be quite modest with with that and humble that many cases uh, we just get it wrong. It's impossible to get it right. I mean, mm. the best example is if you, if you just look at uh, old sci-fi movies, uh, it's, it's <laughs> most of the time it's just laughable. And, <laughs> and, 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 we, we, and, and I think it's very natural that, that, that most of the predictions are really just kind of uh, extrapolations of, of the present. And, mm. and when, when fundamental shifts uh, come into the picture, that, that's something that's very difficult to foresee. So, so for example, if you look at how much uh, workspace have changed in the past five years, I don't think many people for, for saw that. Uh, or, uh, or how retail has been changing in, in, the, in the past 10 years. It, they are all becoming fundamentally uh, different things. And, and, uh, and therefore, I think it's key that we, we provide flexibility for the unknown. Uh, we, we try to design for what we, we expect and, and, and use our best uh, kind of judgment for that, but we leave room for the unknown. Um, mm. So, for example, when I think retail is quite a good example because it is it's constantly kind of reinventing itself. Well, uh, the same models mm. that worked a couple of years ago no longer work, and and we mm. we actually know that they won't work. So, uh, and many of these projects take many many years years to complete. So, one thing that 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 these let's say a retail project has. Um, is constant and there's there's things that are, are dynamically changing all the time and i think i think there's a constant part that is very much about bringing people together to create a destination that mm -hmm. that will that will allow people to to kind of gather there and people enjoy being in that space and then the way that they actually do their shopping the, what they actually do in that space that will surely change throughout time um, but that first part, that that kind of universal uh, kind of condition or or desire to be together, that will not change. And I think this is this is the thing that we can really cater for, and then allow flexibility for the other parts. Yeah, I totally agree with that, and uh, I also agree that these sci-fi movies have lied to me. <laughs> Where's my hoverboard? Back to the future. <laughs> No, that's good. Just conscious of time, uh, might move on to um, our last question before some audience questions. There's quite a few racked up. I might pick some selected ones from that. Um, but our last panel question is um, effective implementation of technologies like the Internet of Things and Smart. Is there a realistic potential to introduce this for retrofit? I think I touched on that already, Michelle, but if you can uh, elaborate, that'd be really good. Yeah, so um, obviously the answer from us is definitely this is what we're doing heaps of projects on at the moment, which is retrofitting technologies into existing buildings. When we're retrofitting smart building technologies, we sort of look at two main principles, one of them being obviously increase improving the operational performance of the building, improving the energy efficiency and the monitoring and the performance of all the systems. But then we also look at um, the value add experience, so the user experience and how we can improve that. So using technology to sort of give people that access to what is available in the building. So their booking systems, connecting with all the sort of facilities and functions in the building we're finding is definitely um, something that sort of helps at making workplaces more attractive places to come and building more attractive places for people to spend time in. Yeah, I think it's yeah. also a really key question of what you do with this. Uh, what, what, what are the opportunities that all this data can can give you? And uh, we have our we have our recently our own in-house commercial consultancy uh, team who is who is actually working with uh, with developers to provide a platform for them uh, that that allows them to 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 kind of. Uh, uh, visualize in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a live way the performance of their buildings from three angles. Uh, 
So one is sustainability and just seeing seeing how the, the building performs as in a kind of in from an environmental sustainability perspective. But it's not limited to that. It also looks at how the individual shop sales are going and how the building performs uh, from a financial uh, sustainability perspective and then also from a social sustainability perspective. And then you have this kind of, it creates this dashboard when you see all of your assets in terms of the three kind of key legs of sustainability and how it performs. Mm. Yeah, I think this, to, uh... to add to, to Gregory as well is that, um, you know, data gives you flexibility. We just talked about that as well. It just, you know, it, it helps you see um, maybe areas where you really wouldn't have thought about before, you know, fitting it Fitting monitors um, and sensors everywhere really helps you give, you know, your asset manager data back, but also it helps you for, for your tenants data. You know, I, I find that there's a real drive for, for tenant wanting to see how the building performed, but it's also, mm. you know, you, you can use it obviously for, for the marketing team when, when we have a tenant engagement portal and, and you know, showing them that, the waste data that we lifting a month is very important, for example, to, to some of the tenants. Um, mm. There's so many things you can do with it, but I think that also we have to be cautious that data can be overwhelming. And we, we have to be cautious that we need it, uh, but we need to be active in, in, in the data uh, reception and not passive. So we need to mm. almost, you know, Needs to be, be sure useful. what we want to see <laughs> yes we want mm. to be sure what we want to see so and surround yourself with and it's not just you know building managers that want to see data it, it's like gregory said it's you know fund managers it's tenants mm. it's everyone so we do need to retrofit yep. it. consultants mm -hmm. as well i forgot <laughs> but yes you know consultants vendors everyone that that is working to make the building a community it's back to what we were talking about at the i beginning. think you're absolutely right so somehow how how that data can be made digestible and comparable in a very simple way i absolutely mm -hmm. agree with you yeah so i think it's a lot about designing the user interface specific for who is going to be using it so having you know one specifically designed for building managers one for portfolio managers and having those different those different yeah different representation of the data too many words there um specific for who is actually going to be reading and accessing it yeah. absolutely exactly my thought of you've just uh, you've just actually put words to it so thank you michelle <laughs> excellent all right um do we have any more on this last question um uh, just keen to move on to some audience questions that we have uh, there are quite a number but I'll, I'll probably just pick maybe two or three do you have any more comments on the last question from the panelists at this stage no it's all good all right uh thank you audience thank you for listening thanks for hearing our wonderful answers from our panelists i'll just read out um a couple of questions i'll start with the first one um here it says you mentioned induction cooking versus gas cooking what are your thoughts on future of heating and cooling both commercially and domestically now i assume that's about heating the building rather than actually cooking there. Um, so look, I'm, I'm happy for a panelist to answer. I'm happy to um, you know, put my thoughts to that question. You know, in terms of heating and cooling, we're hoping that the heating and cooling demand is reducing both, again, as we say, existing buildings, but certainly the new buildings, that demand for heat and cool should be coming down. And everything that we do, every retrofit that we are talking about, the stuff that Annie and Matteo have been talking about should be uh, in consideration when, when we go to change an asset or you have an asset management plan, it should be with the intention of actually reducing that heating and cooling load. It uh, doesn't matter what type of building, and that's both commercially and domestically. I don't know if you've got any thoughts, uh, panelists, on that question. Uh, no, I think to add to it, it's it's more around, you know, uh, again, you know, mechanical technology is moving as well. Um, but mm. like you said, I think, you know, it, for a new build, it's about ensuring that you 
build a shell that doesn't um, doesn't have massive fluctuation of temperature, you know, double glazing using material that helps you maintain a, a temperature is going to be very important. Same with retrofitting. So there's this component of it as well. We need to have a look at, at, at the retrofit stage and at building stage. Um, in addition to that, I think it's about um, use of the building as well. I, I think, you know, for me, my bugbear is is after hours. I know it's very controversial. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just, you know, when, when you're in a built-in environment, do you really need the air conditioning for half an hour? You know, can it, can mm -hmm. can you be okay for, for, for 30 minutes and then, you know, leave at 5.30 <laughs> or, or 6? You know, little things like that. I think it's not all down to, uh, it, it's back to what I was saying and, you know, the individual um choice of, of doing something differently. Um, mm. it, it doesn't have to come from the building owner. It doesn't have to come from the system around you or how it operates. It, it can also start with you. So mm. uh, heating and cooling domestically starts with you. And I think we need mm. to bring that mentality of how you use your domestic um, appliances to, to the workplace. You know, sometimes we treat the workplace very differently. Um, so I think that's important. And gas to induction, obviously, we need to get rid of gas. So we, we need to mm -hmm. move towards induction cooking. There's a couple of questions within this question, I think. Yeah, there were. There were. I, could, I could keep going on with this one. It's, uh, it's quite an open question, but um, thanks for your answer. Then I'll, I'll move on to the next one. I think this, this um, sort of falls on from... Uh, brief conversation Annie and Greg had mentioned around the demand of, of um, technical knowledge. So the question is, one of the main issues is technical and engineering backup slash delivery for market demand. Do we have enough skills to back up the demand? Um, so I'll throw that out to the panel first. Do we have the skill set to cope with this demand? You know, that, that could be consultants, <laughs> that could be the FMs you see on site, that could be the contractors. Um, so I think on our side, on the FM and operational side, um, we, we do find that we have to continuously re-educate ourselves and be mm. very flexible in, in our approach. So what we knew five years ago might not be relevant now. Um, and I think the all different types of expertise is needed. But for me on my side, it, it's about continuously staying abreast of, of the new certification um, mm. on our side to ensure that we know what we need right now. Yeah, absolutely. We've been seeing when we work with contractors, big, large contractors actually having their own appointed full-time sustainability manager, if not sustainability teams. That's quite a, a, a new phenomenon, but, but not not all too uncommon actually um mm -hmm. you know so all the way down to contractor level you're getting that large amount of as you say any education across the board uh, i think you're right there that's that's the key yeah um i'll just ask uh, one more uh, before we uh, start to wrap up uh things um uh, this last question is there a seismic downtrend seen in procuring financially viable sustainable products in the building industry to encourage meeting targets is there a seismic downtrend seen in procuring financially viable sustainable products in the building industry to encourage meeting targets i don't know what you're seeing in terms of the affordability of more sustainable uh, products um dong i don't know in terms of your more sustainable structural materials is is there a, a downtrend or is, is there if i flip that the other way is there a premium on more sustainable structures or are we able to have a a better more sustainable structure at the same or lower cost yeah from the structure point of view ironically at the moment is more sustainable material uh hard to get and more expensive um, for example, people are talking about mass timber structure everywhere. Uh, it has apparent carbon uh, impact uh, advantages compared to other conventional concrete or steel. 
not just from cost point of view, but uh, uh, in the past, we think that's more sort of a uh, slightly cheaper than steel, but actually uh, it's not. It's uh, the price rising a lot because now sustainability become a bit big demand in the market or the mm. developer or designer a jump on it because uh, often, and also recently we're doing project in the UK, um, we've been trying to specify the uh, high percentage aggregator replacement for the um, cement replacement for the uh, low carbon concrete. Um, but uh, uh, in the end, uh, from many uh, logistic point of view, from cost point of view, it was ditched because it's, it's just not possible to source from the local market. If you import everything from overseas, uh, apparently that just uh, doesn't really bring a real value because it had a lot of additional, uh, not just cost, also carbon footprint. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a how to say, I would say it's an investment. It's really need to be educated to by the designer uh, uh, at the first place. And the clients also need to have a, a motivation initiative to drive mm -hmm. this. Uh, it, it will be uh, costly uh, from the start, but I think you have more demand in the market. The, the, the price of the material will be, will be more even more, more reasonable. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a cycle. I mean, let's say it had to be driven by all the parties in, involved in this uh, industry. It's a demand thing, isn't it? You know, yep. uh, when, when there's a demand, there'll be the supply and vice versa. A bit of a chicken and egg scenario. It's the same as you're seeing with, say, the electric vehicle market or, or previously the solar panel market. Uh, the price of, say, solar panels were extortionate and uh, exponentially they came down as, as demand um, rose and supply rose. Uh, the EV car charging, you know, is, is probably out of the price range of most uh, ordinary people but they're com coming right down and you're seeing many uh, people for, uh, buying their tesla threes or whatever um you know uh, hopefully sustainable uh, structures are the the next tesla threes <laughs> we have just all low carbon um uh, concrete structures everywhere um when or, or mass timber everywhere as the supply rises and, and demand increases Um, and any, anyone else on, on that in terms of the price of, of sustainability? I guess from a um, building controls perspective, maybe a while back, it used to be only kind of the big building control companies that had analytics products, but now we're seeing a lot of the smaller ones out there. So as there is more supply for it, it is definitely getting more affordable in the market. You don't just have to pay that sort of higher premium cost for a large company to install an analytic system. There's lots of sort of smaller ones out there on the market now. So I think um, from a controls perspective, there are elements which are getting more affordable. Yeah, absolutely. All right, look, um, we've we've uh, really dived into this uh, discussion really well. And I'd like to thank all of you guys for your participation today. Thank you, uh, extremely panelists, and thank you, audience, for listening and joining us in today. We'll probably wrap it up there, but any questions that weren't answered, we'll endeavor to address them uh, after this webinar. And, and there will be a follow up um, an email sent to you all following this discussion. Uh, there'll be uh, the recording of this uploaded to our Kundal website. And there'll also be a link to some of our eBooks that cover this topic and other wider discussions around the ESG and CSR uh, topics and also building performance and how to retrofit uh, existing buildings and improve existing buildings. So all of that uh, can be found uh, on the Kundal website. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your, your day and the rest of your week. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.